All right, everyone. Well, today we are going to be doing the opening lab for uh, December 2021. So if you're not familiar with this, I do this once a month for uh, some of our Patreon supporters where they send in opening questions and then I do a little bit of research and then I I come on here and, uh, and discuss. Um, so actually a ton of really good questions uh, today and I'll try not to spend too much time on any one question because we do have actually uh, quite a few to get through. But um, yeah, I think we should be able to, uh, to cover everything. And let's just get started with the uh, first question here. Uh, yeah, you guys can see from Ethan, who says, Hello, lately I've been struggling as black in the scotch after e4, e5. Let's flip the board. Uh, knight f3, knight c6, d4. E takes d4, knight takes d4, knight f6, knight c3. So the four knight scotch. Right, you can get it from this move order. White can play knight c3 first and then d4. Four knight scotch, bishop b4. Yeah, this is kind of the most solid move here. Takes bc. So Ethan says, I don't really understand the resulting positions and would love some help understanding the conceptual ideas. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So this position is not uh, too complicated to figure out. Uh, essentially, black is just going to be castling here, uh, kingside, very soon and then typically playing for d5 to fight back in the center. Um, d5 is a nice move because it puts a lot of pressure on e4, and uh, in many cases kind of forces white to take and then undouble our uh, c-pawns, which is kind of important. Um, you can also play these positions with like d6, so for example, bishop d3, you can also play d6 here, castles, rook e8, uh, but I would say these positions are a little bit riskier for black. You're not getting as much space, White gets to play like bishop g5 and maybe f4 in some positions. So those can be a little bit dangerous, although they are they are playable. Most players, um, when they get this position as black, will either play d5 right away, or you can also castle first, white castles, and then you go for d5. And um, yeah, in general, this is a very solid position after takes c takes d5, very comfortable structure. e5 is not really a concern, just to point this out, knight g4 um, hits the pawn, and then this one uh, is going to get quickly hit with f6 as well. So like bishop f4, f6. And I think black is really active here and, and doing great. So this is uh, totally fine for, for black. Um, so normally white takes on d5, c takes d5. And then there's different moves here. There's some theory like queen f3, h3, bishop g5. These are all moves. Um, I don't think black really has to memorize uh, a bunch of stuff here. I think it's just kind of important to know where everything goes. So this pawn typically going to go to c6, rook goes to e8, rook goes to b8, bishop e6. You can bring this bishop back at some point to like d6 or f8. And yeah, overall black's uh, structure here is um, quite uh, quite sound. One thing I just want to point out, like kind of a typical thing, let's say white goes for like queen f3 and uh, bishop g5. It's kind of useful to know here. It's one of the first things I learned about this position. Um, is that even after all this, like queen f3, bishop g5, black isn't really afraid of the move bishop takes f6 here. And a lot of players will even go like h6 in this position, and kind of inviting white to take on f6. And it's been known for, uh, I think, a pretty long while that this endgame is totally fine for black. Despite the double pawns, you put your king on g7, you kind of defend everything, and then the two bishops are really good, especially the, uh, the dark square bishop. So... Um, that's just kind of one useful thing to know because a lot of players, I think, they you know on first on first look, you know, they would want to play like bishop e7, like not to not to allow the doubling, but then you do kind of can fall into under some some pressure here uh, if you play a bit a bit passively. So this one is kind of like a useful useful thing uh, to know. But generally, it's all about the setup here. Rook b8, bishop drops back, bishop e6, and black is all right. Um, yeah. <laughs> right, so generally bishop g5 is not too scary. I like um, throwing an h6 here uh, in many uh, positions just to kind of challenge the bishop. I think maybe you can start with c6 just to secure d5 and then h6 to put a question to the bishop and then the bishop has to choose whether it wants to take or fall back on this diagonal or fall back on this diagonal and in each case, kind of white gives up um, some options. So h6 is a nice way to kind of uh, question this one. 
Um, okay, Ethan, hopefully that helps. Uh, again, these positions are generally very, very healthy for black and um, there's not a ton of ways you can go wrong as long as we're just kind of developing. And um, oh, here, for example, bishop f4, bishop d6 here, a very normal move. Black is fine with trading and yeah, just holding on to these pawns as solidly as we can. Um, okay, let's go to the next question. Just going to get moving right along here. Next one comes from Dean G. And I actually analyzed one of Dean's games for the uh, game analysis yesterday, so that was cool. Um, and uh, yeah, Dean has been submitting questions, I think, almost every every month. So we're following we're following Dean's path here, which is kind of cool when it comes to the uh, the opening. Okay, Dean is asking, after switching to the open Sicilian, I'm learning to play against each variation. Against the Nidorf, is the Fisher Sozen attack decent for club players? So let me put that on the board. Fisher Sozen is uh, famously the Sicilian with Bishop uh, to c4. So Knight of uh, c5, Knight of 3, a6, and Bishop c4. Uh, so yeah, this is known as the Fisher Sozen attack. Dean says, I am looking for a line that is not too theory intensive, but still challenging for black. Uh, when I plug some of the positions into a computer, though, it gives 0.0, .0 after even just a few moves. What are some ideas in this attack? Feel free to instead uh, explore a different line slash system if you feel strongly about recommending uh, a different one. Uh, yeah, absolutely, Dean. So thank you for the question. Uh, I think it's uh, a really good one. And uh, yeah, a lot of um, a lot of good stuff here. So let's uh, let's discuss. Um, so first, uh, first question is the Fisher shows an attack decent for um, club players. And uh, shortly put, uh, yeah, like the the basic idea behind the system. And uh, there is going to be some theory here, and, and we'll get into our, our monthly discussion on whether <laughs> theory is is important or relevant for a lot of players, but we'll get into it. Um, basic premise behind this one is that we're putting pressure on, on this diagonal. Bishop on c4 is uh, quite strong. Black is kind of obliged to play e6 here to try to blunt the bishop. And uh, in the long run, like white plays bishop b3 here to kind of secure it. In the long run, the classic idea was for white to try to hammer on this diagonal with f4 and f5. And, and there would be different ways of doing it. You could castle first, you can play f4, queen f3 early and try to castle queenside. Uh, I think generally Fisher would castle kingside and just go f4, f5. And then you're just putting a lot of pressure on e6 and you're trying to get black to concede on the light squares. Either they go e5 and then they open the entire diagonal or they go e takes f5 or they let the pressure sit against e6, and then of course, that's not always so easy to deal with. Um, nowadays, of course, there's different ways of playing this position. Um, I think tried and true method for black is to go like knight d7 and put the knight on c5, where it not only challenges white's bishop, but also defends e6 and puts pressure on e4. And then again, there's different ways for white to play it. You can play with like f4 here. You can also play like almost a hybrid like um, English kind of attack with bishop e3, f3, then maybe looking to castle queen side and playing with like g4. Um, you can castle here and then play f4. Again, you can play the immediate f4. So there is going to be theory here, but as usual, there's going to be theory everywhere. The nice thing about this line is that you do kind of have this like un conceptual plan that you can just follow. Like I want to play f4, f5 and just hammer this diagonal. So even though the position is, of course, really sharp, at least you have some idea of what you're trying to do. Um, now, when it comes to like the, the computer eval, like it's 0, 0.0, I would say here this is almost completely irrelevant. Of course, if it was good for white, you know, no one would play the knight orf and everyone would play bishop c4. So we have to realize when we're analyzing like a major opening, like knight orf, Grunfeld, Rui Lopez, Slav, like most of those positions are going to be equal for black. Otherwise, <laughs> they wouldn't be popular openings if black wasn't holding their own against all of like the, the main serious lines. So the question is not what the computer thinks about any of these opening moves, because really 
it doesn't matter. What's more important is just finding positions that you kind of understand, that you enjoy, that you want to play, that you look forward to playing um, at the board. I think that's the kind of openings that we want to choose. Um, so if you can find lines that you really believe in and you kind of like the plans and the type of play, that's what you want because that that's what it, that's what's going to decide things in the end. Just whoever feels more comfortable in the middle of the game, who's like a little bit more in tune with the ideas, who calculates better. Um, this is all going to matter much more than whatever the computer thinks about any of these positions. Um, okay, so um, I would put this one, you know, on like the like passive to aggressive scale or like solid to aggressive. I would probably put the system at something like like an eight and a half or, or a nine, right? If 10 is like the most aggressive you can play and one is like the most like timid, like Kali system <laughs> you can play, I would put this like eight or nine, like really, really high up. So it's definitely not to everyone's um, taste because you are kind of risking a lot as white. If the attack doesn't kind of succeed, then this bishop on b3 ends up being uh, somewhat of a strategic dud because it's just kind of firing into uh, this brick wall here on e6. And so if you never make anything of it, or if you end up losing the e4 pawn, because this one is going to be weak once you play f4, then of course the position can collapse for white. So if you're looking for some kind of wild attacking system, very, very aggressive, I would say this is a good choice. If we're looking for something a little bit more let's say playable and uh, doesn't require you to be, you know, just going all in and super aggressive from the opening. Um, I'm still a big believer of the, the system uh, I recommended in, in my own book on the Sicilian, the H3 uh, variation against the Nidorf. So this is a book I wrote like at this point, it's been uh, like seven years, <laughs> so quite a long time ago. Uh, actually more, more than that, maybe uh, eight or nine years uh, when we were actually working on the book. Uh, my co-author was uh, international master uh, Zhanyubek Amanov, and um, we okay we looked at a bunch of lines uh, against the Sicilian. We we came up with a repertoire, and we liked this one against the Nidorf. At the time, this was like 2012. Wow, 10 years ago, 2013. It was very very fresh and starting to become a lot more popular. Nowadays, H3 Nidorf. You know, again, there's a ton of theory here. Like there's going to be with pretty much uh, every major move. But I still feel like this one is actually a very playable uh, approach, meaning you don't have to know a bunch of theory to make it work. You don't have to like get yourself into sharp positions where you don't understand what to do. The ideas behind the system are, are still pretty straightforward. White wants to play g4. In many cases, put the bishop on g2. And you can actually play it in many different ways. Either the bishop goes to g2 and you play positionally by castling kingside. This bishop exerts pressure all over the diagonal. And essentially, it's an improved version of uh, a g3 Nidorf, which a lot of players actually like as well. And in fact, I would recommend this to anyone who wants to kind of play like a more positional approach. I think this one is a very safe system for white and it makes a lot of sense. You put the bishop on g2, you castle and you kind of control this d5 square. Neither black has to play e6 and accept uh, kind of a space disadvantage. And then one of the plans for white in that position is to go h3, g4, where black plays e5 and then fights for the center, but of course gives up the d5 square in the long run, and then white tries to, to use that. So g3 is kind of like a nice positional approach. h3 I always felt like was kind of the best of all worlds, because you can play like g4 and bishop g2, and you can also play this one much more aggressively, like playing for g5, h4, and like the typical kingside attack. And then white plays bishop e3, and it's very similar to like an English attack. The bishop here even often stays on f1 to just cover the c4 square, because you're going queen d2, castling queenside, and then you can throw your uh, kingside pawn storm uh, as, as usual. So I've always liked this one because I felt like it's very flexible. And uh, again, the ideas are very straightforward. You're just looking for an improved version, either of the g3 Nidorf or of like the English attack. Um, it's also very similar in nature to the uh, the Keras attack after e6, g4. And we can kind of see the logic behind <laughs> playing h3. Like, okay, we can't play g4 in one move, so we'll, we'll set it up because that's how much we want to throw uh, the g-pawn down. So I'm still a big fan of this one, and there's... Lots of players here you could uh, you could follow. I feel like all like the, the top guys have played this one from time to time, but like Vichy, Nepo, MVL, they had like a bunch of really, really uh, 
nice games here. So that would be my personal recommendation. But again, the bigger point here is like, you just got to find a system that you like, that you kind of understand the ideas, you, you like where the pieces go, you like the middle games. And uh, then, yeah, you can't, like you, uh, you look forward to the next time you get to, to play the position. <laughs> that's the kind of, that's the kind of openings we, we want to find. <laughs> Personally, I think no one should play E4 because I have a harder time countering. That's funny. Um, yeah. Okay, Dean, hopefully that um, was helpful. And uh, let's go to uh, the next question. Alright, next one comes from uh, Sultan Al-Habzi, who is asking, uh, what do you think of this variation of the Alakine? E4, Knight of 6, uh, let's put it on the board. I think I included it here. E5, Knight D5. D4, D6, C4, Knight, B6, F4. Okay, this I assume is, yeah, the four pawns attack. Takes, takes, C5. And in particular, the line that goes D5, E6, Knight, C3, Queen, H4, check, G3, Queen, D4, Queen, E2, takes, Knight, B5, takes, 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 check, King, D7, takes, King, C6. I analyzed this position with my friends and they said that it is losing for black, but I feel that it is a very interesting position and black has a lot of chances to win. Um, okay, so yeah, I looked at this one a bit because I am i wasn't familiar at all. Uh, not like too much of an E4 player myself, um, except against the Sicilian. I'm happy to <laughs> challenge it anytime. And I uh, never really played the Alakine as black, so I never really looked into all these like crazy lines. Um, okay, so yeah, first thing I should say is, um, you know, it could be an interesting position and that black has a lot of chances to win and that it is objectively losing for black. Like that, both of, all those things could be true at the same time. Like it could be a really sharp dynamic position that's like objectively lost. That's totally possible uh, because black is um, down uh, a full rook at the moment and is hoping to eventually win back the knight on a8 uh, and then only be down in exchange, but with some, some nice compensation. Um, so yeah, objectively it might be lost, like according to uh, the engines. And you know, I checked briefly because, of course, I, I have no idea. And like, yeah, engines give white, you know, some advantage. But at the same time, it does kind of feel like one of those positions where white has to like play like an engine to actually uh, convert uh, the win or, or can get a serious advantage. Um, so. Uh, yeah, again, it, I looked at it and it's like, yeah, if you're, if white just plays like an engine, then you might be in a little bit of trouble. But if white like has no idea what they're doing here, as I imagine most players, <laughs> their first time seeing this position would be lost or would be like lost, like not knowing what to do. Then, yeah, I feel like in a practical game, black has a, a ton of chances here, right? Like you, you play b6, you get the bishop to uh, take this knight, this bishop, this light squared bishop is just like a super strong piece. Black definitely has a ton of upside here. So for this position, I, I think you you have a point. Like you definitely can have some practical play, especially if you've like analyzed this position even further, like with an engine and you know like some of the typical ideas, then uh, yeah, definitely it's worth going into at least a couple of times because I, I do think black's play is a lot easier. Um, for anyone curious, I think like knight of three is the only move, which is okay, not uh, not particularly particularly challenging move to find, but the idea is that white wants to play like a rook f1 or castle, knight g5, and just get very quick counterplay against uh, f7. I think here black has to play like knight a6, castles, bishop h3, and then h6, very important move to stop knight g5. And then, and then it continues, white like plays e6, but okay, these are a lot of moves that like stockfish can find, but for a human, especially e6, Mm -mm, not, not so easy to uh, to decide on this move, right? Just like <laughs> giving up the the pawn for seemingly almost 
almost nothing. Of course, there's like 95 check and etc. Black has to play f6, by the way. Anyway, so super, super sharp position. Um, long story short, yeah, I think I think black has some good practical chances here. Now, is this position like worth worth studying? Like, is it a good use of time? I mean, I'm not sure. My guess is, you know, going back through this line, then in most of uh, the games here, white is going to deviate at some point. So this is always the risk when you study some kind of long theoretical variation. It's like, okay, if the position is interesting to you, then, you know, go ahead and study it. Like, whatever, it's good for your chess culture, and it's kind of good for your understanding just to analyze some positions deeply. But I wouldn't be kind of expecting to, like, get this, you know, all the all the time, because it's just going to be, like, a very specific line that you might get once out of, like, 100 games, 1,000 games, like, you know, who knows. Um, also, there there's other moves for white as well, especially, like, I think up until... So, okay, if they play f4, you know, c5, d5, e6, knight c3, this is all very normal for white. Queen h4 check, g3, queen d4. This is the moment where white has, like, a pretty serious choice, and queen e2 is uh, by no means the only move here. Um, like, queen takes d4, and knight b5 is also a very dangerous uh, approach, so I would definitely check this one as well. If this is an opening, you know, you want to play uh, quite often, because this one looked very scary for me, knight a6, d6, and uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, actually, we should be looking at this from black's point of view, excuse me. So yeah, this would be very scary for, <laughs> for me personally to go into this um, on the black side, but I'm not much of an alakine player, and from what I understand, you guys are very okay with giving up a lot of space and fighting against the space advantage. So I don't know, maybe this is still uh, playable if you really enjoy these positions, but I would be quite quite nervous about this one just, uh, just from my point of view. So hopefully that helps. Uh, Sultan, long story short, the, the position you asked about, I think, yeah, like in a blitz game or rapid game or even a classical game, even if white knows the position is like plus one or whatever, it's definitely not an easy position for white to play. Um, but uh, yeah, as far as the whole line is concerned in general, like risky stuff, I would be <laughs> I would be careful. I noticed lately, I, I, I was just looking at the theory that in this position, I feel like g6 has been uh, preferred by um, a lot of the, the higher-rated Alakine players that go for this position and then putting the bishop on g7. But, okay, this position also, to me, doesn't look like a particular picnic for, for black. <laughs> it looks pretty scary. But, uh, okay, it's all again, it's all about finding the openings that uh, you like to play. Um, all right. <clears throat> Let's go to the next question here, which comes from Kirk D., Okay, and Kirk is asking, uh, I play the Slav against d4, c4. How do Slav setups work against Catalan systems? Uh, is a6 a thing against the Catalan? Uh, yeah, so, right, um, definitely interesting question. Let's put the Slav on the board. And in the past, I don't know if it was Kirk or maybe someone else, uh, someone asked about this variation. So what happens if like white plays a normal Slav and then goes for g3, kind of like a Catalan setup? And uh, I believe I covered this position in a previous opening lab. Um, you might have to go back and check, but it might have been like November 2021, October or September, probably October or November. But I covered this position and uh, I mentioned that um, black has a couple of solid ways to play this, like you can go bishop f5 here and just develop the bishop and then go e6. Um, you can also play g6, which uh, essentially transposes to a fian kettle grunfeld which is a very solid uh, opening for black. You might say like, oh, I'm not a Grunfeld player, but that's just something you're thinking in your head. You don't, it doesn't have anything to do with the position. You can still play this position despite being a Slav player. Just tell yourself it's a Slav position and <laughs> then you'll be fine. Um, because it's not like you have to play the whole Grunfeld just to play this this one position. This one is very solid for black, like you can castle here and eventually play like bishop f5 and uh, and so on. Um, so those are kind of like the solid ways to play it, especially just bishop f5 right here. 
And then the more critical way would be to just take the pawn on c4, because this is kind of what the Slav is designed to do, is to take this pawn on c4 and then secure it uh, with b5. These positions are definitely going to be a lot more sharper, so that might not be everyone's cup of tea, but this would be the other kind of, um, let's say, critical way of handling this, uh, this system. Um, so I'm not sure if Kirk is asking specifically about this position or just in general, if white plays like uh, knight f3 here, for example, black goes d5, and then white does something like this. Um, I'm not sure if, if this is what is meant by like Catalan systems, but since I already covered this position in a previous opening lab, I would uh, advise Kirk and everyone else to go go check out my my thoughts on, on those lines, like dc4 and bishop f5. Um, I guess I might as well just uh, tackle this one as well, because a lot of players do struggle with playing like uh, with playing against like knight f3, uh, g3, or like when white starts with c4, and then you have to go like c6 if you're a Slav player, um, and you're trying to get d5. Um, but in general, this stuff is, is pretty solid, and black's idea here is to play d5, and usually black is able to develop um, the light squared bishop. Uh, so at some point, you're trying to go like bishop f5, e6, other bishop gets developed to e7, knight of six, and uh, actually one way to think about it, it's like you're playing like a reverse London system, if white does something like this. Um, this is considered a very, very solid approach for, for black. Um, now, uh, second part of the question was, is a6 a thing against the Catalan? And uh, this one definitely confused me a little bit, but what I imagine Kirk is asking is, um, I imagine Kirk plays the a6 Slav against knight c3, known as a Chebanenko Slav or Chameleon Slav, um, and is asking whether he can also just play this if white goes like g3 or if white plays like g3 in some other move order, like can you play a6 here? And um, this question I feel like is kind of forgetting the whole point of the <laughs> the a6 uh, a6 Slav. So let's let's take a step back because I feel like the most useful thing here is to kind of be to kind of like reframe the question of what black is trying to do against d4. One thing that's very important to understand in this position is that the move that black would like to play most times is bishop f5. But when white has just developed normally knight f3, knight c3, you can't go bishop f5 too early in this kind of position because you get hit with c takes d5, e takes d5, queen b3. And this has just been a problem for a very long time, and it's still a problem. White hits b7, this d5 pawn is hanging, so queen b6 does not save anything because knight takes d5, uh, wins the pawn for white. And lo and behold, black has to make some kind of really serious concession, either losing a pawn or playing some extremely weakening move like b6, where, which will be very painful when white's bishop ends up uh, on b5 with check, and black has no solidity uh, on the light squares. So long story short, bishop f5 cannot really be safely played in this position. It's too early for the bishop to be developed. And everything else that black plays in this position is kind of designed around trying to get this bishop out, with the exception of e6. Because that's what black is trying to do. Black is trying to get the bishop out outside the pawn chain, then play e6 and develop this bishop. And everything else is kind of a concession. So e6 blocks the bishop in immediately. Some players try for g6 but the bishop on g7 is not considered as well placed as it is on this kind of main diagonal, especially when white plays e3 and just kind of blunts the bishop. And also it doesn't fully solve black's problems. Let's just put some position on the board, castles, castles. Here it's just still hard for black to complete their development because uh, if the bishop comes out too early, it's gonna get kicked and harassed. And if the knight comes out to d7, then it's blocking everything and it's not well placed on d7. So eventually black has to make some kind of concession, either taking here or playing bishop g4, giving up the two bishops, uh, and so on. Um, or black can play dc4 in this position, and by the time white is able to you know, take back the pawn with a4, e3, bishop takes c4, by that point black is able to play bishop f5. Now of course there's no queen b3, and even though black gave up a little bit of the center, a lot of Slav players consider this position very, very solid. I mean, in general, this position is extremely solid as black is able to get everything developed and yeah, fights for control over the light squares. 
Okay, and then you have A6, the chameleon slav, uh, aka the Chebanenko slav. And the point of this one is not just to control the B5 square. The point of this one is actually it's just like an extremely clever and useful waiting move. So this move A6 will be useful in all kinds of different structures, like if white goes for the exchange slav, then A6 is useful. Or if white just keeps the tension, then eventually a6 uh, will also be useful because black can play for b5 and get some queenside space. But generally this move is also helpful because black doesn't block the bishop or commit anything and still reserves the right to play bishop f5 and finally develop this bishop comfortably. Um, and so it's actually not that easy for white to come up with a challenging move here. If white plays e3, then okay, they're blocking in their bishop. And now black can develop this guy. And we already have ideas like queen b3, rook a7. All of a sudden, black has different ways of defending the uh, the b7 pawn. Um, not to mention there's also b5, which becomes a lot more uh, playable. If white doesn't block their bishop and play something like bishop g5, well, at some point, black is just going to take and hang on to this pawn. And then a6 is really useful here as well. And if white commits with something like c5, or c takes d5, well then black recaptures, this knight gets the c6 square, bishop can come out safely, or if c5, then there's no pressure on d5, the bishop can come out safely, because queen b3 is no longer any kind of double attack, right? Queen b3 has become a lot weaker. So that's always been the idea behind this a6 move, is that it's just kind of like a nice waiting move to eventually get the bishop out. Of course, there are drawbacks, you know, this move is a full tempo, and white can get maybe a nicer version of the exchange slav and etc. White, of course, has many ways to fight for the advantage, but that's the idea. So, you know, when it comes to the, uh, like the G3 slav or like the Catalan type of thing, is this move A6 that useful? If you think about it, black can just play bishop F5 right here. Queen B3 is not really a problem if the knight's not on C3 yet. So this a6, it kind of loses its value, right? The whole point is that it's this like nice waiting move so you can develop the bishop, but you can develop the bishop right away. <laughs> so, so this is where it, you know, it gets me thinking. It's like a lot of people, they, they study the opening in terms of like moves, like which moves should I play in this position or this position? But what I think, and I think what a lot of coaches think is like, it's much more important to understand the ideas. It sounds like the same thing, but it's really not. Like understanding the ideas behind the moves is what helps you make better decisions in the opening when your opponent does something you're not familiar with or when you don't maybe remember the theory, but you can still kind of find your footing because you understand the ideas behind what you're doing. And so it can kind of make sense to you at the board. And so it's not about just like memorizing, okay, in this position I play a6, in this position I play bishop f5. The key thing is to understand the point of what you're doing so that even if you don't remember, you can still kind of figure it out because you have that uh, knowledge. Um, so yeah, long story short, a6, not really a thing against the Catalan. <laughs> Maybe in some very specific positions, but um, it, yeah, the a6 Slav has a very specific purpose and here it's just kind of not needed. Like you can just develop the bishop out to f5 right away. Queen b3 is not really a concern. You can go queen b6. And yeah, essentially black is uh, black is fine. Um, okay, Kirk, hopefully that helps. Hopefully I didn't uh, totally misunderstand your question, but in any, in any case, I think, I think that was a, a useful talk to have anyway. And uh, yeah, let's go to uh, the next one. Okay, uh, next question comes from Scott, who has a long question about, um, actually a pretty interesting question about the, the London system. So Scott says, I'm wondering about a specific bishop exchange in the London, uh, initiated by white on d6 that activates, in quotes, the black queen. I've moved away from making memorized moves, good, good, <laughs> to thinking about each one, even in the opening during my longer time control games, which is what got me thinking. Uh, sorry, this question is long. Okay, let's uh, take a look. So in the London system, there are several situations like this simplified one, where we retreat the bishop to g3 in my 
memorize mainline. Okay, yeah, let me put um, the, the sample position on the board. I think it was d4, d5, uh, bishop f4, e6, knight f3, bishop d6. Yeah, and you can get this kind of thing, like here is what Scott is saying. Here is a moment where white typically plays bishop g3. You can also get this with like e3, bishop d6, or like knight f3, knight f6, e3, bishop d6. This kind of thing happens a lot, where these bishops uh, target each other. Okay, so the question is, where we retreat the bishop to g3, my understanding was that it was best to retreat in the London for two reasons. Uh, one, to encourage a trade on g3, which after hg opens uh, the h file for the rook. And uh, number two, declining the trade on d6 uh, doesn't give the queen a free move to, uh, to get into the game. Okay, but after bishop g3, Scott says it looks like Bishop takes g3 is a bad move for black. Uh, and there are other moves for white like e3 that continue natural development uh, through surrendering the hope that black will bit on the or bite on the bait of the retreated bishop. So it seems like the retreat is more about hope than strategy. Uh, it's not, but we'll we'll get into why. Looking at my third candidate move, taking the bishop on d6. The evaluation in Stockfish doesn't look like the disaster I thought it would be, <laughs> so I am rethinking what I would do in this position now that I'm not going to proceed along memorized lines. Uh, as an aside, there is a similar but different bishop exchange on d6 I make in the uh, Queen's Gambit Declined, where the Queen takes on d6, and I don't worry about it at all. I guess I'm wondering if the fear of activating the Black Queen in the London is, uh, is a red herring. Okay, so long story short, Scott's asking here about um, whether Bishop G, the value of Bishop G3 in, in the London, whether this is worth uh, the full tempo. And uh, yeah, so to answer the question, uh, this move Bishop G3 is not just about, let's say here, not just about hoping black will take on G3. Of course, white is happy with that. This move is more about keeping the tension. Uh, meaning we don't take on d6, we just sit on g3, and we invite black to take on g3, and now both sides have to kind of sit with this tension and just develop around it. And uh, it's a little bit easier for white because we control this e5 square. So that to me is kind of the key difference. When you take on d6, uh, number one, queen takes d6, black is able to then play like knight d7 and play for e5, it becomes a lot easier to kind of get this key break in. Um, of course, if the pawn is still on c7, personally, I would also be considering c takes d6, where black can just take with the pawn and control this square as well. And this is kind of typically a useful square for white in the London. So yeah, to, to simply answer the question, bishop g3 does have more value than, than just being hope chess. You're keeping the tension in a way that's kind of unpleasant for black because we're keeping control over the e5 square. Um, and eventually, in many cases, white does kind of plant the knight on e5 in the London, and then it's very useful that black isn't able to fully uh, challenge the square. So one sample line, just to show where this can happen, is like this one, for example, where both sides kind of develop naturally. And right away, notice that like black can't play knight d7 in this position. Knight d7, b6, bishop b7 would be like a very natural uh, setup here, but you can't go knight d7 while this bishop is, is still hanging. Um, and again, it's still not very fun for black to take because hg. So knight c6, bishop d3, b6. Now there's different moves here for white, like you can even play knight e5 in this position. Queen e2 is also a move. And uh, yeah, there's ideas for white here to play for e4. And uh, e4 just introduces more tension in the position and then creates a really serious <laughs> threat of e5, just winning a piece. And so this e4 move also will pose more problems for black. Uh, so the London can get quite uh, quite tricky, of course, and like with any opening, there, there can be a lot of theory and ideas, and absolutely this is one of them. And, and again, we're putting pressure and again inviting black to take on g3, you can go hg, open the h file, and it's very, very nice. So long story short, it's harder for black to keep the tension than it is for white. For white, you can just sit bishop g3 forever, it's like you're never really compelled to, to take on d6 if you don't want to. But for black, at some point, you're going to have to deal with e4 or knight e5, so there, there are some concerns. Uh, 
Um, yeah. Yeah, Black does have ideas of like Knight H5. And uh, I'm not like a huge specialist on all the move orders, so I can't say when exactly you should be reacting to this one and in what way. But yeah, if the knight takes on g3, hg still opens up the h file, so white can kind of uh, play against that. Knight h5 maybe can sometimes be met with bishop h4. I think it kind of depends on, on the position, so I don't want to give um, any kind of uh, wrong rules of thumb here. Um, okay, so... Hopefully that makes sense. And although the stockfish eval is just going to be equal here, um, of course, I, I, I mentioned this in the previous question. In general, the computer evaluation in the opening really should matter very little because it's all going to be equal like, <laughs> at a certain point. Like black is going to generally be okay. Otherwise, the London would just be a good opening and everyone would just play it, and <laughs> etc. Um, and yeah, a lot of times the engine evaluates two different lines as being approximately equal, but from human point of view, one of them poses a lot more problems to the opponent. And that's the one generally I think is going to be kind of giving you uh, better chances in, in the game. Yeah, so you know, if you imagine two pads, right, or like one move you make, the opponent can, can make five moves and they're all totally fine. Or you can play a position where like for every move that you make, your opponent has to find like an only move just to survive, right? That second scenario is a lot more dangerous. Those are the positions that we, we kind of want to get when we're playing for the initiative um, with white. Uh, Already. So uh, yeah, Scott, hopefully, hopefully that uh, made sense. Long story short, taking uh, bishop d6 just kind of releases the tension, releases some of white's pressure, keeping the bishop on g3, uh, more annoying for black to deal with in the long run. Um, and I would definitely encourage you, because I really like this thing that Scott said about not playing, uh, not just uh, making the, like, memorized moves, because that's very important. You should really, like, understand the moves you're making in the, in the opening and really believe in the moves that you're making. In the long run, this is how you will be able to understand different, not just opening positions, but like middle game positions. And I think will make you just a much more knowledgeable player um, in the future. So I definitely recommend um, studying some of the, like the top London players and seeing how they, they play like with this tension and put pressure on the opponent. You know, guys like Kamsky, um, when Carlson plays in London, I mean, there are so many, uh, so many players play the London. So of course there's many, many to, to choose from, but I would really, Grishchik as well is a big one. I would really take a look at their games and see how they're how they're handling those positions. Uh, much more valuable than just trying to like memorize move by move. Okay, in this position I'm supposed to play here, in this position I'm supposed to play here. It's better to get this kind of broader understanding of the the general picture. Um, question of the chat: uh, What about playing c4? So yeah, there are many options for white to play c4 in in the London, and that kind of just changes up the structure. Many London players, they like to put the pawn on c3 because they want a solid uh, position in the center. Playing c4 kind of gives more space for white. Um, and But then we kind of transpose back into like a classic queen's gambit uh, type of position, um, which is very playable, but maybe not what the, the London uh, system player is looking for. Um, okay. Let's go to the next question. All right, next one comes from Always Double Check, who has been asking questions for uh, a little while. And uh, they're asking, can you cover this position in the mainline semi-slav? Uh, yeah, let me put the, the Fen code on the board. So d4, d5, and uh, there's actually many different move orders to get to the position that um, is uh, going to be getting asked about here. I think I did with this move order. Uh, but essentially, it's uh, semi-slav. And one of these positions where black doesn't take on c4 at any point, white plays b3, and basically we get no no trades, one of, one of these structures, which again can come from different move orders, like white can play bishop e2 in the opening, sometimes bishop d3, sometimes they play b3 early, sometimes queen c2 and then b3. Um, sometimes it starts with like knight f3, e3 slav, and then goes into semi-slav. 
Um, you can even get these positions like I've actually gotten in these positions many times, <laughs> starting with knight f3 on move one uh, and playing this, and then eventually it just kind of transposes to something like this, bishop b2, and okay, there are lots of nuances to the move order here, but yeah, eventually you get something like this, and again, black goes b6, bishop b7, and we get some position that uh, looks like the one um, given. So let me get back to that one. So queen e7 here, rook ad1, uh, rook ad8, rook fe1, and rook fe8. So this is the, the position uh, given. And always double check says, Shanklin calls it the most critical position of the variation. And I was wondering if you could talk about how play proceeds from here and what the strategic themes are. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, so interesting question. And uh, I should say I do have uh, a bit of experience in these types of positions because I've played d4 for a while. And like, yeah, I've played, um, let's just call it like e3, e3 semi slav positions. I played these positions quite a bit, sometimes with the bishop on e2, sometimes with the bishop on uh, d3. And uh, yeah, again, there's many different move orders here and many ideas. So one thing I'll, I'll just say right off the bat, it's probably pretty unlikely that you're going to get this exact position a whole lot um, because black has a lot of ways to deviate before this point. Um, so uh, Shanklin's course I'm, I'm familiar with, it's at a, at a pretty high level. What might be the most critical position, you know, for someone at like GM level, uh, might still you might not get uh, that often because it's not like it's not critical as if as in like everything is like forced to this point like you might imagine like a bishop g5 knight or where like every move is forced and then and then you get some position you know after like 16 only moves by both sides and then that's some kind of like crazy position uh it's not exactly like that like no like in this position lots of players will play c5 here rook c8 rook e8 h6 like e5 at some point, like a6, you're going to get all kinds of stuff. Um, so I would encourage you not to spend too much time like analyzing any any one position too concretely, because again, it, people are going to switch it up. Someone's going to, lots of people are going to take on c4 at some point and play c5. There's just going to be like a million different ways for black to deviate. Um, and I play this position, uh, or I play this system a bunch of times, and I've had this exact position very, very few times. <laughs> so maybe not even, uh, not even once. Though to be fair, I haven't played with um, Bishop e2 in the opening uh, too often. So my general bit of advice here would be to focus on uh, the structures, because in this uh, type of position. What often happens eventually, black will play some kind of c5 or some kind of e5, or sometimes white plays for e4, which is one of white's main ideas, just to go like bishop d3 and break in the center with e4. Eventually, you're going to get some kind of classic structure, like an isolated queen pawn or hanging pawns, something like this. One of these structures that can come from like almost any opening. Um, so I would suggest focusing on like learning how to play these kinds of structures, because that's what's going to help you broader, uh, in a broader sense, when you play any kind of position like this, because then it won't matter what move order your opponent chooses or kind of what they go for, you're going to have some understanding of how to play the eventual structure. Um, so again, isolated queen pawn positions and hanging pawns, because uh, in many cases, black plays c5, for example, let's just let's just play this move here. General reaction to c5 is for white to take on d5. Black typically takes with the pawn. And then you get this kind of structure, which is a very fluid one, because um, like many different things can happen. But eventually, either black is going to take on d4, or we're going to take back with a piece, and black gets this IQP uh, with the pawn on d5. Or at some point, white might just take on c5, and then either black takes with the piece, or black takes with the pawn and gets hanging pawns. And uh, again, at some point, this is going to happen, and so you're just going to get this kind of structure anyway. So the most important thing is just understanding that you know how to play like against an isolated queen pawn or with an isolated queen pawn against hanging pawns with hanging pawns, um, because this is what's going to help you again, regardless of the move order. When it comes to this like exact position, like I looked at the theory a bit. White has many different moves. There's like h3, 
Bishop f1 seems to make sense just to kind of line up the queen, uh, the rook against the queen, and uh, and then prepare to play e4. Uh, once again, e4 is kind of white's main break that you're playing for in the position. Uh, if you can get this one in, and black isn't able to kind of react actively with c5, generally white is doing pretty well. Um, and at this point, black often plays c5 because they're kind of out of useful moves, so they finally make this break. And then once again, white takes on d5, ed5, and we get this kind of position where one day we might get uh, an IQP. Um, and I think the move here that white often plays is g3, which makes a lot of sense. Of course, it's connected with bishop f1, and then the bishop is going to be well placed on g2. Bishop is also can jump out to h3 and put some pressure on this diagonal, especially if black wants to go rook c8. Um, so this one seems like kind of uh, how I would play it. And in general, I've always liked these positions from white's point of view because I like kind of playing these uh, structures. Um, but it should be said that it's not exactly the most aggressive way. And uh, honestly, if I was suggesting something against the semi-slav, like when I was, mm, let's say, 18, 1900, 2000, I didn't really know a whole lot of theory. Um, and But what I was doing was I was just kind of developing my pieces <laughs> as naturally as possible every game. So against the semi-slav, I was playing bishop g5. And a lot of players, they don't want to play this one because they hear it's a lot of theory or they're worried about like the Botvinnik with dc4, like the Moscow variation. But I can tell you guys, I was playing this move for many years <laughs> without knowing a lot of theory, uh, just playing, you know, normal developing chess, developing the bishop first, then playing e3, uh, then getting the bishop out. And uh, essentially, I've always felt like this is a more natural way to play. Then once I got to like, 22, 2300, 2400, I started playing some very strong players who knew what they were doing really well in these lines. Then I realized, okay, like I got to be careful. This is like a, a super sharp position. But until that point, like, I don't know, I, I think I would suggest just kind of playing for natural development um, rather than going for honestly any of these like E3, E3 lines. Uh, mainly put, I just don't think this puts that much pressure on, on black. It's just kind of like white is playing for a very, very uh, small and, and kind of simple advantage. And it's really not that easy to handle, <laughs> even for even for strong players. Like you get some advantage in an isolated queen pawn position, and that can be really, really difficult to uh, to convert. So my general feeling, it's like, I think people should just just kind of play like more natural, more aggressive systems. It doesn't really make sense to like play e3 early on and just block the bishop, you know? <laughs> like, but of course, yeah, I don't know, chess is different at, at different levels. At higher levels, you know, they're looking for different things. They do want a very, very like small, solid, stable advantage. They want to like minimize risk. Um, but we have to realize that when we play, you know, any kind of e3 slob or anything like this, you're also posing a lot fewer problems for the opponent, right? Because you're not playing as aggressively. And uh, like I mentioned, like black has a million things they can do here in like a bunch of different setups. And even if your opponent knows zero theory from this position, it's like they're gonna have no problem just getting something solid, just kind of developing their, their pieces. So that kind of needs to be said that it's like, again, not that I'm really trying to dissuade anyone from, from playing this way, because I, I do this myself. <laughs> But I just think it's like you have to realize that as white, you're not really playing for any kind of serious advantage. You're just playing for like a very small practical edge because you like playing against the IQP. You like playing against hanging pawns. You kind of like these structures. So if that's the kind of thing you're happy with, by all means, I, I think that that's a totally fine approach to the game. But then it goes back to the first point I made, which you should focus on learning the structures. Isolated queen pawn, hanging pawns, and so on. Studying lots of examples, how to play against it, how to play with it, understanding the differences, the different plans and themes, uh, and so on. Because that's going to help you, again, regardless of the different um, moves or move order that uh, the opponent uh, chooses. Um, okay, so hopefully that was uh, useful, not too, not too rambly. But um, yeah, long story short, white is playing for this e4 break. At a certain point, black is going to have to play c5 or e5 because they just can't wait forever. 
if black plays e5 um, too early, uh, it's important to point out that a lot of times either black is getting left with this isolated queen pawn, sometimes white just wins the pawn outright. Sometimes this knight b5 move can be very scary, especially with the bishop on b2. So it's kind of hard for black to get any of these pawn breaks early on. Uh, c5 is also kind of similar. As soon as black plays c5, white is taking on d5, black is going to have to take back with the piece uh, with the pawn either right away or after knight takes d5 again. It's always a pawn that lands on d5, and then white takes on c5 and leaves black with an IQP, or plays bishop b2, and is always ready to recapture on d4 with the piece. So this is kind of what white is playing for in this position, just a very, very small advantage uh, playing against the, the IQP. And uh, finally, just to, to kind of cap off the, the whole thing, it's like, even if the opponent doesn't know what they're doing here as black, usually best case scenario, you end up with a nice version of an IQP, <laughs> like an isolated queen pawn position where you're you're much better. And so even in like best case scenario, you still have to know how to play that middle game, how to convert against the IQP. So that's still going to be like the most important thing that's uh, that's driving the results. Um, okay. Yeah, hopefully that was useful. And then, uh, yeah, hopefully our talk about this position was also uh, also provided some value. But yeah, I like this kind of bishop f1 idea and then getting ready to put the bishop on g2 or on h3 kind of sets up the bishop nicely for any way that the position might transform and also helps white to, uh, to push e4 here. Alrighty, that's going to do it for this question. Let's uh, keep moving right along. We have a couple questions left actually. Uh, next one is from Ricker. Okay, Ricker is asking simple question. <laughs> d4, d5, c4, knight f6, knight c3, e6, a3, bishop e7, bishop g5. The question is if a3 is a good move. It is not a developing move, <laughs> but I get sick of the knight being pinned by the bishop coming to b4. Um, okay, Ricker, I think. I think I get where you're coming from on this one. Um, yeah, so what to say? I mean, this one comes up in, in different move orders and we should be specific with the move order here because for example, if you play c4 and your opponent plays knight f6, not playing e6 and supporting the center with the pawn, then I would suggest taking this one. If they don't defend the center with their pawns, we got to give up our c-pawn for one of their center pawns and take the full center because this position is going to be nice for white or you can play knight f3 first and then e4 or if they take with their queen then you get a nice tempo for your knight and eventually you get e4 you get a big center and white should be really really happy um, but uh, this isn't really about the move order of course black can play e6 here and then after knight c3 you got to deal with bishop b4 so ricker is asking okay if e6 then can i play a3 in this position or if d4, knight f6, c4, e6. Should I play knight c3 here and allow bishop b4 or play a3, d5, and then knight c3? And then we might easily get something uh, like this. So I think the question is just about a3 in general. And yeah, I think, Ricker, you, you probably kind of feel this intuitively. It's a very slow move. So you can play it. You're not going to be worse after a3, but you are kind of giving up a tempo. Um, that could be used for something more useful. And essentially white is conceding any hopes they have for an opening advantage. It's already very difficult for white to get an opening advantage um, as it is. Black is very solid all around, but especially for playing moves like a3 super early, you're giving up a lot of your chances to kind of put pressure on the opponent uh, from the opening. So I'm not a huge fan, um, especially because bishop b4, it's a thing, but it's not the, the scariest thing in the world. Um, I will give you a couple uh, pointers though how to deal with it. So for example, in this position, this is like the classic Nimzo setup. A lot of players start with knight f3 here, which uh, makes sense. Actually, we're gonna have a question about, uh, about this exact thing, like knight f3 versus knight c3. And if black plays bishop b4 check here, well then knight d2. 
and you don't have to worry about the doubling of the pawns. You can play knight d2. You can challenge the bishop with a3 now that a3 is a tempo. And yeah, in general, this is considered uh, really solid for white. Um, you can also play bishop d2, by the way. This is also totally, totally fine. So this is one way to do it. You can develop the knight here first. But let's say black goes d5. And now you just want to develop your pieces normally. So you go knight c3 here. You could also play like bishop g5 in this position. This one is kind of interesting um, because after bishop b4, knight d2, uh, again, we're not worried about the, the pin as much. Um, but let's say you just go knight c3 and then black does something like bishop b4. Uh, this is the Rogozin defense. It's not that scary. We're not super concerned about bishop takes c3 here because we have bc. And the dark squared bishop is, of course, very important. So if black is willing to give up the dark squared bishop, in many cases, white should be happy to take it. But yeah, after bishop g5, you know, we counterpin this knight. And it's not so easy for black to get some, like, insane counterplay, like knight e4, queen a5. This is very, very hard to achieve. And we're always going to be able to defend the knight. Rook c1, queen c2, and so on. Um, now, there are some players who will play, like, h6 here and g5 and knight e4 and really go after this pin. Then just go queen c2 and you're uh, you're totally fine here as white. Yeah, uh, if black does something like this, bc, these pawns always get undoubled anyway. You play e3, bishop d3, and white gets to develop. And well, in the long run, black has really weakened themselves with h6, g5. So uh, yeah, essentially I would say this shouldn't be something um, that is too worrisome for d4 players. Um, but if it is, you can always delay developing the knight to c3 and do other stuff. Bishop g5, you can play Catalan. There's different options here. But I wouldn't recommend spending a tempo on a3. I think it's just, it's a little bit slow. Black will just get a very equal position out of the opening. And regardless of what black plays, like d5 or c5, bishop b7 later, you know, this a3 is not going to be too too bothersome for them. Um, so, okay, Ricker, hopefully that made sense. Yeah, question about black giving up the, the bishop on c3. I mean, it really depends. It's, it's not like this is always good or this is always bad or it's always equal. Um, the point is when black plays bishop takes c3, the position changes, and both sides get something out of it. White gets the bishop pair. White gets a little bit better control over the center because of the, the c pawn moving, uh, or the b pawn moving to c3. Um, but black gets to play against white's kind of weakened structure. Um, but it, it, it always kind of depends, right? Like if white plays um, knight f3, for example, and <laughs> this is something that Sarawan, he always... Um, <laughs> He always roasts Nimzovich for this, but Sarawan will say that Nimzovich would just take on c3, like without even waiting for a3, which I'm not sure totally true, but I feel like I have seen some games like that where he like just takes and not even, not even forces white to spend the tempo on a3. And so this would not be a good version for black because, okay, we have this like typical trade, but black also wasted a tempo and it's actually better for white that the pawn is back on a2 because this bishop has better access to like the a3 square and white doesn't have to play like a4 or something from a3 to just open up the square. So this would be like a good version for white. I think white is better here. But if white plays a3 and spends this tempo, honestly, in this position, I would probably, I probably would take black because I do like playing against the double pawns and here black has an extra tempo compared to before and the bishop doesn't have a3. So this is kind of like a better version. So for most of these things, it's not like there are any hard and fast rules, like it's always good or it's always bad. It's more just like a trade and you have to evaluate it based on uh, what else is going on um, on the board. Yeah, and so and both sides kind of play around this. That's why it makes sense for white to play queen c2 first because then they're trying to get the bishop pair without weakening their pawns, but this this comes at the cost of development. So it all kind of balances itself out, and it's how you um, deal with those balances, whether you can make the most use out of your advantages and minimize uh, your opponent's strengths. 
<laughs> yeah, does this mean Sarah Wan's not a fan of the Huebner variation? I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's a little bit, uh, a little bit different there, because <laughs> the position has been a bit committed. But yeah, I always found that funny. I gotta find that clip where Sarah Wan's just like, you know, the Nimzo Indian is a great opening, but Nimzovich did not play it as <laughs> it's played today. He would just take here and, yeah, just give up the bishop uh, immediately. Um, but anyway, that's a, that's a debate for a different day. Uh, next question comes from Mitch. And, uh, okay. Mitch is asking... Um, Okay, da, da, da. why is it considered that black equalizes relatively easily in the Nimzo? Oh yeah, we actually have like a whole Nimzo section here in the next uh, couple of questions, including the last one. Um, so many repertoires avoid the Nimzo by going into the Queen's Indian or Queen's Gambit declined, uh, but that also limits options against the QGD, like Knight C3 into exchange variation. Uh, okay, Mitch continues, black gives up a bishop for a knight in most positions, and the doubled c-pawn can get traded for a d-pawn, sometimes, yes. Uh, meaning that black gives up the bishop pair, and then white gets a better center, then trades uh, d-pawn for white's b-pawn. Uh, shouldn't that favor white? Uh, but engines and the grandmasters say black is equal, uh, and then can you maybe explain a bit uh, of why black is doing so well here? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, really, really good question and kind of ties into uh, the last one. And uh, to kind of just give some context, D4 players, they do have to make, this is maybe one of the biggest decision uh, as far as the repertoire is concerned for D4 players. Um, because if you play Knight C3 in this position, you kind of get a better version of everything. So against uh, the QGD, you get to play this position without having committed your Knight to F3 which is nice. In many cases, the knight does want to go um, to e2, although you can still play this with uh, knight f3 as well. Um, on the uh, Benoni, this is also a better version because here white can play a lot of different options here, like e4, f4, whereas if white had already committed the knight to f3, white has a lot fewer options here as well. Uh, the only drawback to knight c3, the only drawback, is that it allows the Nimzo. So Nimzo Indian actually is a great opening. <laughs> Just maybe not how now Nimzovich originally played it. Um, so, so Mitch is asking, like, why is this considered such a drawback, right? Because still, even in this position, a lot of players, myself included, will often just play knight f3. Uh, not to allow the Nimzo Indian, because here we can, we can play knight d2 or bishop d2. Um, but to get a wor verse, uh, worse version of d5, of c5, of b6, and so on. Queen's Indian doesn't even exist against knight c3. Forget about a better version. Queen's Indian is not even a thing because white goes e4 and just <laughs> takes over the whole center, right? So this is, this is not a Queen's Indian. This is just black is worse. So why is it that white is willing to accept like so many repertoire penalties? Like you have to play a committal, committal version here, you have to play committal version here, just to avoid the Nimzo. Um, so let me explain. And uh, well, actually, let me say, so when I was first starting out with d4, I would allow the Nimzo, because again, I was just developing my pieces, and I was like, okay, knight c3 is the most natural move, I want to play for e4, and then on bishop b4, I would actually just play like knight f3, bishop g5, I just did this against everything, and up until a certain point, it was absolutely fine. Um, but then I did start getting kind of punished in these positions. Specifically, this one I found very tough for white to play. Uh, b6, bishop g5, let's say h6, um, g5 here, and bishop b7, something like this, maybe knight e4 first. I don't think it matters too much, but bishop e7, e3, this knight will live here, black goes d6, knight d7, knight f6, and uh, eventually, let's say we get something like this. I'm sure there's different move orders. Um, here actually is one of the positions where black does take, because a lot of times black has to be worried about this kind of thing. So black will even take, in many cases, and just play this kind of thing. 
And yeah, I found these positions very, very tricky for white to play because black has super strong control over the e4 square. Black has this very simple plan of knight d7, knight f6. And in the long run, these pawns are quite weak. Bishop on g3 doesn't feel very active. And yeah, I just felt like black has a lot of long-term strategic trumps. Of course, I don't have the two bishops, but also at any point, black can just take on g3 if, if they want to. So I really struggled in, in this kind of position because I just found it very difficult to, to handle white's play. Like white really needs to play very energetically, like playing for, for d5 and c5 and like different pawn sacks. And I just found it very unnatural. Uh, and then for a while I was playing queen c2 here because I was like, okay, I'm sick of playing these like double pawn positions after knight f3. Queen c2 doesn't allow black to double the pawns. And so, uh, yeah, let me just play this one. But here... Black is also fine, even though they don't get to double the pawns, because white has to spend a lot of time to get the bishop pair. And so that's kind of, to answer, I think, the, the overall question that, that Mitch was asking, why is black okay in the Nimzo? Uh, black gets a lot of time, uh, typically, in, in their development, which is very logical. Notice, like, in the first three moves, black develops their entire kingside. White develops 0% of their kingside, literally 0%. And black has developed everything. <laughs> so in a lot of like Nimzo positions, black gets nice lead in development. White's king has to hang out in the center for longer than, than black's king does. And so this is not always so comfortable for black, or for white, I should say. Um, and black has a lot of different options in the positions as well. So after queen c2, like there's many different ways to play it. There's castles, there's d5, there's d6, c5, b6. Many, many different lines here, and in all these lines, white is kind of behind in development and always having to uh, catch up. Um, so yeah, when I played queen c2, I think I was around like 2,000, 2,100, 2,200. Yeah, I really found found it tough here because I it was just like not used to playing behind in development. And uh, yeah, lots of games where I lost to like random stuff. Like for example, castles, a3, uh, takes, takes. Uh, someone once hit me with this gambit, b5, which if you've never seen before is really tricky to deal with from white's point of view, because here black is now sacrificing a pawn and just gets like, you know, supercharged Benko gambit if you take, um, because black is just way ahead in development and, and the pieces are all coming out. So, that, and of course black can just play like normal, like b6, bishop, b7, d6, knight, d7, and eventually play c5, d5, and just blast open the center before white's ready. So, yeah, lots of ways for white to go wrong here, whereas black's play has always felt very natural. You're just developing the pieces and striking in the center, where white has to play with, like, uh, early uh, queen development and then trying to get the pieces out, like e3, bishop d3, knight e2. Or if you want to develop this bishop first and, like, forget about it, like, <laughs> you fall way behind in development here with bishop g5 and, um, and then playing e3. So it's, uh, it's tough for white. Since those days, I've since uh, come back to, to the Nimzo. So, of course, I played Knight of 3 for many years. Um, then I started allowing it, the Nimzo. Now, once I kind of understood a little bit better, I was a little bit stronger player, like 23, 2400. I kind of understood a little bit better how white is supposed to handle these positions. But for me, yeah, it was always, it was always a lot easier to play on the black side. Because I also played Nimzo from black's point of view for, for many years. And, uh, yeah, it was always just, like, much, much easier. Um, so it's no surprise that almost like every top player has included the Nimzo in the repertoire at some point. Um, and I mean, like, I mean, absolutely everyone. <laughs> Just like Magnus, Anand, Kramnik, I think Kasparov even played it, you know, many years, Aronian. Maybe like MVL hasn't had like too many Nimzo games. I'm sure he's had a bunch. <laughs> like, yeah, Nimzo is just, it's kind of like in everyone's repertoire because, um, not only is it very straightforward, black also has a lot of options. It's not like uh, an opening where white can choose, you know, white does have many options as well, like f3, e3, g3, knight f3, and so on. But against each of white's options, black has a bunch of options too. So you can play d6, like you can play flamingo style, uh, as Jesse calls it, where you just go d6, castles, queen e7, knight d7, or knight c6. You know, you can play with b6, you can play with d5, kind of more like Queen's Gambit decline style. And so, yeah, black has a lot of options, and for the most part, they're very comfortable. Um, now, Mitch was also asking about um, a position where 
black not only gives up the bishop, but also plays d5. Uh, so for example, like in f3, in this variation, after d5, sometimes white plays a3 here and forces black to take. And then we get a structure like this, um, where after c5, which is the main move, typically white takes on d5 here, gets to trade off one of the double pawns. Um, and this position, I mean, totally wild and really not that simple for white. So knight d5 here, I think is kind of like the main move. And um, okay, white can't go e4 right away because knight takes c3 is hanging. Uh, and so here white is often falling way behind in development, especially with <laughs> f3 being played, like makes things kind of hard for white in the future and white really has to catch up. Um, but okay, these positions, like white goes dc5 here, and then black spends some time taking the pawn back, white gets to develop. These positions are super, super sharp, um, but uh, usually black gets a better structure in the long run and then white has to kind of justify it with uh, dynamic play. But even this position is very playable maybe a little bit uh, riskier. I think knight takes d5 is a lot more uh, popular there, but this position is also playable again because black is ahead in development and does have some strategic trumps. Like black gets some good control over uh, the light squares. And you can imagine some kind of like dream position if black was able to trade light squared bishops, sometimes white can be left with a bad uh, dark squared bishop. And that's kind of what black is playing for, even though the pawns have been uh, undoubled here. Though this one, I would say there's a lot of upside for white here. Uh, Vidit played a really amazing game in 2019, and he crushed Kramnik here, uh, for anyone that, that's curious. This is also in uh, the first World Championship match of Anand Carlsen. Very interesting game where Anand had some uh, very nice attacking chances out of the opening. These positions are pretty dynamic, but this whole F3 thing, the onus is really, is really on white here. I mean, you're playing F3 from the opening, you know, this is normally a bad move. <laughs> but, so to start with this one, like you really have to follow it up with some uh, energetic play after that. Um, okay, so to, to sum up, uh, Nimzo good, everything else bad, um, because black has a very flexible position here, lean in development, lots and lots of options. Of course, it's very solid, it's very playable. Again, white has many ways of putting pressure here and uh, and outplaying black, but it really, I think, takes some subtlety and some deep understanding from white's point of view. So my feeling, of, and I've always felt like for club players, lower rated players under 2200, the Nimzo just kind of feels a little bit easier to play from black's point of view. The moves are just a little bit more, uh, more natural. Okay, guys, hopefully that was useful. Let's go to the next question. I think we have two more. And then uh, we're going to be making room for Ultimate Sensei. Uh, all right, this question comes from Hatch Crowley. Actually, let me get some, some tea here. Okay, and another Nimzo question. I've been playing Jesse's Flamingo, <laughs> the Nimzo slash Bogo Indian, usually playing d6 rather than d5 Nimzo lines. Uh, and I always seem to get in the most trouble when white pins my knight on f6 with the bishop. I think maybe part of the problem is that I'm just too afraid uh, to play g5 in front of my king in these structures. Uh, for example, let's put it on the board, d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, bishop b4, knight f3, castles, e3 takes takes d6 bishop g5 h6 bishop h4 and hatch is asking about this from uh, from black's point of view i think i'm fine here but i just really struggle to find a way forward in these kinds of positions i can of course play knight bd7 but then i feel so cramped and like i can't do anything um yeah okay thanks hatch so yeah for anyone does doesn't know jesse released uh the Flamingo, I think it was last year, maybe 20, maybe 2020 actually was, uh, an easy life for black where he recommended, you know, if you don't want to know any theory, you just want to play simple chess, you play knight of six, e6, bishop before against anything, you take whatever lands on this diagonal, whether it's a knight or a bishop, you just take it at some point, um, and then you play like d6, queen e7, knight d7, e5, or b6, bishop b7, knight e4. You just play with uh, the bishop and, and two knights. 
Uh, and it's a really, really straightforward approach. Actually, a lot of players, they played some version of this all the way up until Grandmaster and didn't really like study a lot of theory. They just kind of played these positions and uh, did totally fine. So question is how to deal with uh, the bishop on uh, g5, h4, how to deal with this pin. And Hatch kind of answers the question. Um, <laughs> he says maybe part of the problem is that I'm just too afraid to play g5 in front of my king. And yeah, in the long run, at some point, black is just playing g5 and breaking the pin. It should be said that the pin is not that dangerous. Like if you go knight d7 here, if white plays e4, you know, then you can play g5 and, and try to take uh, the pawn, right? So it's kind of hard for white to get e4 in. Um, and in the meantime, black is playing knight d7, maybe b6, bishop b7, etc. So like e3, for example, b6, bishop d3, black is in time with bishop b7 to uh, control this square. And again, if e4, then, uh, then g5 is kind of a possible issue for white. And uh, yeah, eventually, like you don't have to play g5 super early, but eventually, maybe once white uh, castles, then g5 starts to become a real important move for black. Bishop g3, knight e4, and then this is kind of how black plays it. You get this fantastic e4 square. Maybe you throw an f5 at some point, maybe knight d f6, queen e7, and you play around uh, the knight on e4. Uh, now, I do have to point out, like, when you play g5, you do need to be careful about this kind of piece sack. And sometimes this is definitely uh, dangerous. So you do have to be careful, um, but it's good to know like typical ways of dealing with this, either like king g7, rook h8, and you try to fight on the h file. You can also play for like e5, e4, try to shut down this bishop. It's not always just like a devastating attack. In many, in many positions, uh, it simply just doesn't work for white. So it is something to be worried about, but uh, in many cases, black is totally fine. I should also say this is kind of a specific case um, because here black did kind of castle um, pretty early, which was not uh, totally necessary. So for example, you can start with b6 here. As many players like to do, I showed this line in the, I think the previous question, Mitch's question. And so a lot of players will develop bishop b7 first, and then even take, and then go h6, g5 with the king on e8. And then of course the knight takes g5 sack isn't, uh, isn't really a thing at all. Um, so yeah, this h h6 g5, this is a very important way for black to deal with this pin, and it comes up in a lot of positions, so I would definitely try to uh, <laughs> muster up the courage to play it, because it is kind of uh, important. Uh, the other way, let's say you get this position after castles, and uh, so here a3 I would say is not really the best move for white, because okay, I just don't like a3. You spend the tempo and then you give black what they want. Bishop g5 I think would be kind of a more challenging move. And um, here you could play like d6, knight d7, queen e7, e5. Oops, this is kind of normal. Um, another way to challenge this bishop I just want to mention is the move c5. Because this is how you kind of punish white for developing the, the bishop early in these positions by playing c5 and challenging white on the dark squares uh, and in the center. Because white is developing their queen side, but still king side development is slow. So if you really want to punish white, this can be a way to do it. For example, e3 takes, takes, d5, and eventually you're going to take on c4 and leave white with isolated queen pawn, which is kind of interesting way to play Nimzo as well. b6, bishop b7, knight d7, take on c4, and, and uh, black is, well, typically pretty solid there. Um, again, many different ways of playing the Nimzo. I'm just providing some options. But uh, yeah, the big, big idea black does have to eventually uh, be able to play h6, g5. That said, the pin isn't that dangerous. It's just like, <laughs> if you really want to break the pin, then you got to go h6, g5. But uh, you can also just like ignore it for some time. d6, knight d7, queen e7. It's not like white can really do a whole lot to you on this pin. But okay, at some point, it's very natural to want to just play h6, g5. And uh, and yeah, just, uh, just make your life a lot easier. But that's the key idea, h6, g5. 94. You got to find a way to make that work. Uh, okay, Hatch, hopefully that was helpful. And uh, all right, we have one more question here. Okay, and this one came from uh, Clark. 
aka Paul, who's asking, uh, in a recent Sensei discussion on openings, you mentioned the Italian as a good place to start for lower end club players. Uh, I have tried it, but I've hit a problem and ended up a pawn down whichever way I play it. Okay, let's put it on the board. E4, E5, Knight of three, uh, Knight C6, I think, Bishop C4, Bishop C5, C3, Knight of six, D4. Yeah, the old Joko piano takes, takes, Bishop B4 check. Uh, then whatever I play, knight c3, bishop d2, king f1, um, or even f2, or e2, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> Black's knight takes the pawn on e4. Yeah, knight takes e4 is going to be Black's next move here. I, I think I understand the question. Um, in the games I played, this pawn loss remained a deficit into the endgame and proved sufficient for losses. Uh, any advice, or should I use the Rui Lopez instead? Okay, Paul, before we, we take drastic measures and switch to the Rui Lopez, uh, yeah, let's, let's go through this position. Because we have a lot of options for white in the Italian game. Like, officially, Italian game starts um, maybe somewhere around here, like bishop c4 or bishop c5. Of course, knight f6, knight g5 is like fried liver attack. Totally different story. But uh, yeah, let's talk about the, uh, the Joko piano a bit with uh, c3, d4. So this is really um, a classic opening. This one goes back centuries, literal centuries, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. The first master, uh, or for one of the earliest known masters, Giochino Greco from Italy, uh, would play this one and had lots of uh, crushing victories. And, and this is the one I've always kind of liked for beginners because it just just shows so many of like the romantic dynamic elements of chess and really allows white to play for the initiative right from the opening. Because that's what white's trying to do. White goes c3, trying to build a big center with d4. And black, of course, uh, if they want to fight back, they really have to fight back in exactly this way. Takes, takes, bishop, b4, check. If they don't give this check, if they play any other move, then white gets to defend the nice center, and white just gets a very nice position right, uh, right off the bat. So bishop, b4, check, this is, of course, critical. And uh, let's go through the options here, but let me note that c3, d4 is not the only way to play the position. A lot of players will just play d3 here, and we get something that is known as like uh, a slow Italian, uh, where basically the play is not as sharp, and white kind of develops for a much quieter middle game. So the knight goes to d2, and we actually get a position that's very similar to the Rui Lopez. Uh, in terms of the, the structure. White plays h3, knight f1, brings a knight to g3, castles kingside, bishop drops back to b3, and eventually white tries to advance on the king side and play on the king side, sometimes in the center, uh, with an eventual d4, once everything is kind of built up. So there's different options. You can play d3 here. Um, you can also play d4, e takes d4, e5, which is maybe a nice wrinkle worth throwing in, where first you attack the knight, Black should probably play this typical counter-attacking move d5, and then after bishop b5, something like knight e4 takes. This is a very interesting position where you're not going to be losing the pawn. You actually get a pretty nice center, but okay, black gets uh, their fair share of, uh, of play as well with the knight on e4 and like possible f6 breaks. Anyway, this is another option where white is not losing a pawn. You get a very playable position. Um, but let's talk a little bit just about this one. Um, and uh, your options here. So the classic way of playing this position was always to go knight c3. And then after knight takes e4, black wins a pawn, white's idea was to just castle and just play for development. And the point is you're inviting black to take on c3 and even grab more material. Now the knight on e4 is hanging. If black does uh, go ahead and try and take all this stuff, then here white famously plays queen b3 and encourages black to take even more material, though at this point it's a very difficult position already because f7 is hanging and the bishop is hanging. And so yeah, black is already possibly losing material here, getting checkmated after bishop g5 and rook e1 stuff. Uh, anyway, this was, again, this has been known for centuries and centuries that white just gets tremendous attacking chances here. Maybe bishop a3 is also good. Um, so of course that's what white is hoping for, but since then, black has kind of figured out better ways of countering this kind of sacrifice. And a lot of players have realized that bishop takes c3 is a better move. 
with the idea that after white takes back, black plays d5 and kind of secures a knight on e4. Black has already grabbed one pawn and then say, okay, I'm good with one pawn. I'm just going to hold on to my knight in the center. And here I don't think white really gets enough for the pawn. So after bishop takes c3, white then figured out, well, I can play this move, d5. The theory continues from here. There's quite a bit of theory here. The positions get pretty sharp. Um, if black knows what they're doing here, they're going to be fine. Again, there are no winning openings in chess. So this is like kind of a dangerous position for black if they don't know what they're doing. But of course, experienced players, they've been around the block a couple of times. They know the theory. They're going to be able, they're going to know what to do here. They're going to be able to, to sort themselves out. At lower levels, though, I think this is still very playable. I don't think a lot of people are gonna <laughs> are gonna be able to figure this one out. I'm talking like maybe under 14, 1500. I think this is still very, very playable. And this is kind of how white should be approaching this position because this is a very sharp, very aggressive way of playing. These other moves, not knight c3, are a little bit more timid. Um, knight d2 is also a pawn sack after knight takes e4. This one is similar where you're sacrificing a pawn, but Okay, you have to be able to follow up correctly. Bishop d2 um, is actually a very solid choice, where if black takes on d2, you go knight takes d2 and you defend the pawn. If black plays knight takes e4 here, uh, then you can actually win the pawn with this trick. Bishop takes b4, knight takes b4, uh, bishop takes f7 check, and then the queen comes to b3, and white is winning back the pawn. So this is the key trick that white kind of needs to know if you want to play bishop d2 here, which is maybe the most solid move um, of the bunch. So again, um, after knight e4, taking on b4, knight takes b4, and bishop takes f7, followed by queen b3 check. Black usually plays like d5 here, or moves the king, and then queen takes b4. And then material is equal, you can castle here, start developing your pieces. You have this nice e5 square, black had to move their king early. It's uh, approximately an equal position. Black is generally okay, but this is the solid one if you don't want to just play a pawn down. Um, and that's what I would what I would recommend. Um, but again, there are different ways to play it. You can also try to play the more aggressive way with knight takes c4 in castles. I think this is also very much worth trying. Um, or if you don't want to play a, any kind of sharp position out of the opening, then you can switch to d3, kind of quiet Italian. And uh, yeah, lots and lots of um, room for, for middle game play here. So if you're not looking for any adventures or excitement in the opening, I would suggest this one. Um, this is very much similar to the Rui Lopez. You can also, of course, play the Rui. Absolutely nothing wrong with this opening. All right, guys, I think that is going to do it. Uh, thanks, Paul, for the question. And thanks, everyone, for submitting some really great questions for uh, this month. Of course, this was December 2021. Uh, lots and lots of good stuff there. Hopefully that was instructive. If you guys missed uh, the previous questions, the whole thing will be available um, in the VOD and uh, it will be posted to YouTube later on. Um, so you can check that out. But uh, that's going to do it for the stream. Uh, once again, I do this once a month for some of our Patreon subscribers. You guys can check out uh, info um, on our Patreon uh, page if you want to see uh, the sign up and so on. Um, but yeah, that's going to do it for the stream.